So I want to start by talking a bit about why automated machine learning is interesting to us. And the motivation here is that while Bosch is a pretty big company and we have like lots of different products at the end of the day, and yes, yeah, since AI is really, really hyped right now and already for a couple of years and more than probably now, than, now probably more than ever, um, there are actually like many, many different projects going on that are trying to leverage AI for their use cases for their products. And so these are very classical products like computer vision for autonomous driving or so, which are very naturally deep learning or computer vision problems. But there are also like many new projects, like things like household devices, power tools, lawn mowers or so, where the previous generation of the products, they didn't really have any machine learning component. These were like classical engineering domains, so to say. But now also these people are trying to figure out, is machine learning helpful for, for their products and can they improve their products by that? And so that means you end up with these, all these kind of different projects uh, where you have like s some use case that you want to solve. You have like typically like a physical device where you want to run your neural network on at the end of the day. Um, these devices are different, the data is different, the use case is different, and each project has their own domain experts. And sometimes these people are deep learning experts, but sometimes they are also not deep learning experts. And then all of these different people, well, they, they are setting up their problem, and then the question is now, what kind of machine learning model do you use to, to solve the problem? And so either you do this in a, in a manual fashion, or um, they also use their, their custom automated machine learning solution, either their, their own solution or something from the open source world or so. And um, so this is a, a pretty interesting yeah, setup, I would say, um, because on the one hand, you have also deep learning experts, but on the other hand, then you also have projects where there are really people coming from this classical engineering or natural sciences domain where people are doing machine learning or deep learning for the first time in their life, and they're not really an expert on this. So this is like probably like the thing that we are building automated machine learning solutions for, right? But the issue is here is that when every project is doing their, their own solution, then of course this approach is not very scalable and um, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't really leverage the, the project that you've already seen before. Um, and so because of that, um, I'm part of an automated machine learning group in the, in the research department at Bosch. And the goal in our group is that we are building automated machine learning solutions which are scalable across all these projects. So um, we want to get rid of the setting where every project has their own solution, but rather we want to have like a couple of solutions that are reusable by all these different projects. Unfortunately, right now, I would say there's not a, a single machine learning solution or automatic solution which can solve all your problems. Um, so we are basically working on these three pillars here. So the first is very classical black box optimization. And the use cases could here be classical machine learning problems like hyperparameter optimization for machine learning. But it could also be like any other black box optimization problem which is not at all related to machine learning. So you can think here about, well, you just have some machine that has some parameters that you want to tweak or you're producing something and this production line also has parameters you want to tweak. Or it could be any kind of algorithm like from classical computer vision problems over like PDE solvers or just generic other optimization toolboxes. And almost always these algorithms have, have parameters that you want to tweak to get the best performance out of these algorithms. So then we also have like two pillars on, on the NAS side of you, I would say. So the first is we are using a lot of evolutionary algorithms. Um, so here we are talking about yeah, classical computer vision problems, but also very different kind of data types. Like we have a lot of time series data and also radar data, for example. And these are approaches we typically apply to this like small to mid-scale problems um, since evolution tend to not scale that well to, to bigger problems there. Yeah. And then on the, the other side of the spectrum, um, from very generic to very specialized methods, we're also using one-shot methods. Um, so the use cases here are these typical large-scale computer vision problems like for autonomous driving, for example. So today I want to talk mainly about these data tools since this is the fields that I've been actually working in and so this will be the focus. To be, be a bit more concrete, um, what I want to show today is the first two points are basically an insight in what are the, the techniques that we are using, what are the, the problems that we are facing and also some example results so to say. And then the last and third point is more on the bit more academic and researchy side where I want to talk about search-based design for neural architecture search. Okay, so let's start with evolutionary algorithms. Um, I think many of you are probably familiar with this setup. 
but I will just repeat it anyway. So here the problem is you want to find a neural network which is having high task performance on your problem. And then very often um, you're not just caring about a single objective, but you also want that your models are running very efficiently. So you typically also optimize for something like the, the latency, so the time for like a forward pass or the inference of your neural network. And uh, the methods we are using here are evolutionary algorithms, and the principle is illustrated here on the left in the circle. And that's actually very simple. So you start with some population of neural networks. You would pick one of them, which is performing well according to some criteria. Then you can mutate that neural network. So mutation in the context of NAS means you can add a layer, or you remove a layer, or you change some, some hyperparameter of a layer. And with that, you, you generate a new network. And then you would train it and maybe measure the latency. And then this is kind of the feedback for, for the evolutionary algorithm. And this you would then repeat many, many times. And the progress you can see here on the right. So you start off with this green rectangle. And then over time, you generate more and more architectures. So all these different dots in the plot, these are all different neural network architectures. And you're trying to get to like the top left corner of the plot, which is like high accuracy and low latency. So that's, that's what you want. But of course, in general, these objectives are very often contradicting each other. So there's typically not a single best solution, but rather you end up with this like curve, which is called the Pareto curve, that is giving you the, the Pareto optimal solution. So meaning that either very high performance at like poor latency or very, high, very low latency at a bit poorer performance. And this you just repeat many, many times, and then you end up with this set of solutions in the end. So the output is not just a single neural network, but it's actually like a set of neural networks. So why are we using evolution? Um, I would say it was quite popular in us a few years ago. Now I'm not sure anymore, and of course there are allowed so many alternatives to this, but I'm still a big fan of this. Um, first of all, because they are like, just like super simple methods, and you can explain how they work to basically everyone with an engineering or science background in just a couple of minutes by, by looking at the circle, basically. Yeah. And that means um, they are typically also like, people easily understand them. They, it's not too hard to apply them to, to new problems. And they are also very generic optimization methods. And you can like, run these kind of methods on all types of problem. Doesn't really matter what kind of neural network architectures you are interested in. Doesn't really matter what type of data you have. You can almost always like, out of the box run this. As a nice side effect, um, you cannot just treat your neural network architecture, but you can also include other parameters from your training pipelines, like typical training hyperparameters, but also things like data preprocessing um, easily by also like defining mutation that change these values. Then almost naturally, this also works for multi-objective optimization. So there's like a huge bunch of literature on multi-objective evolution. So that's also easily doable. And then finally, what I think is also more important nowadays than, than ever is that they are just like embarrassingly parallel. Basically, the circle on the left, you can just run it on parallel on as many machines as you have. Okay, so one comment on, on multi-objective optimization, I already mentioned it. And for us, multi-objective optimization almost always means a hardware area optimization, what people also call it in the literature very often. And so that means the, the other objectives beside accuracy, they relate to how efficiently does your model run on the hardware that you want to deploy it. And that means um, in, in addition to this NAS loop, you also have this hardware evaluation loop, so to say. So once your neural architecture search algorithm generates a neural network architecture, you also need to bring that on the hardware and measure whatever you are interested in. And then you typically also have to go through some other post-processing steps and like third-party tool chains from the hardware vendor and so, um, so that you can actually measure what's the latency, what's the energy consumption. So brief comment on what I meant by you can basically work with all kinds of architectures. So here are just a few examples of like what we have seen in our use cases or what, what you can do with these kind of tools. Um, so this is very simple, ConfNet, um, no big deal. That's like what most methods probably can do. Um, but you can also use things like these Fresnel-like architectures with script connections. Um, what you can also do is, well, if you know that some basic building block from the literature works quite well, like a mobile net block or ConfNex block, you can basically also just put this in and treat it as a layer, and then by one mutation, you could also add these kind of layers. Um, we can also easily work with multimodal architectures, uh, and we've also worked with like time series data where you have like convolution, 1D convolutions, LSTMs, or you can also have mixtures of these, these things. So. And if you don't really care about efficiency, um, you can also like easily build ensembles 
because when you've already run these backbox NAS methods, at, at the end of that, you already have a, like a pool of hundreds or even thousands of trained neural networks, and building a sample from that is basically for free because there's no additional training required. Um, so this you can also do to like either improve your performance or use these ensembles for other things like looking at robustness or uncertainty. So some. Okay. okay, so here's a, a typical use case. And this is like an object classification problem based on, on radar data. So this is from the automotive domain where you have like radar sensors in a car and you're like measuring the radar signals and then you want to classify like is there like a car or a two-wheeler or some object where it doesn't really matter if you override it, for example. And the type of data you have there is like on the one hand, which is called the radar spectra, that's illustrated in the plot here on the top. Um, so this is not natural images, but it's image-like data. So you have this like 2D structure. And so, well, it just seems reasonable. Why not just try 2D convolutions on this, right? And then in addition to this radar spectra, you also have this other branch. Um, which you can see on the bottom here. So the radar spectra are these images, and then there's also like more like feature, features which are already engineered in some sense. So there you run through some classical signal processing pipeline for, for radar data, and then you end up with like this 1D data, so to say, uh, which is giving you the, the features from this classical signal processing pipeline. And then you want to process these two branches and merge the features at some point, and in the end do the classification. And so the results you can see here on the right, the plot is quite similar to what you've already seen before. So on the x-axis, you have uh, here the number of max, so this is like a proxy for how efficient is your neural network. And then on the y-axis, you have the accuracy. And uh, the green point here is like a manually designed architecture, and then in blue, you see the, the result of the multi-objective evolution. And here we get quite a lot of uh, reduction in the max at the, kind of the same accuracy, and sometimes you also find networks which are performing a bit better. And so this plot is actually a pretty good example for what we see very often. And by that, I mean that humans are typically pretty good at designing architectures which have a high performance, but they are not so great at designing architectures which are also running really efficient. Um, so in that sense, very often we are using these NAS tools as a technique for, for compressing um, the model that was already designed by, by a human. And so this is really where you, I would say, gain really a lot, so reducing the model, not necessarily improving the performance of the model. Okay, so then we also did some extensions of these approaches to hardware software co-design. Cool um, so whenever you're using a NAS method, which, which is effectively a, a black box method, this basically works out of the box. Um, so now we are considering the setting where you're not given a hardware and you want to find the best neural network for this particular hardware. But now we are considering a setting where you, like either you can choose from a list of available chips or you have a hardware which is also parameterizable. So for example, you can still like choose buffer sizes or a number of processing elements or so. And these parameters you can just easily add to your search space, so to say, and you can introduce mutations in our case that change this number of parameters and then your NAS algorithm is not just picking a neural network for you, but it's also picking the configuration of the hardware. And the rest is basically the same, so you Train the neural network, get the accuracy, um, you have the hardware configuration, you can deploy the neural network with that hardware configuration, and then you get back um, the rest of the plots here. Okay, so this is an illustration for or like an ablation study that we did in the beginning, so to say. Um, so plot here basically the same as always. And what we did here is we looked at 26 different configurations of the hardware. So these were 26 configurations where Basically, the, the experts who designed the hardware, they, they gave them to us and said, yeah, these are probably reasonable configurations of the hardware. And for each of these 26 different hardware configurations, we ran dual architecture search. And then each color basically encodes the Pareto optimal architectures for that specific hardware configuration. So for example, when you look at all these screen points, then these are like the Pareto optimal models that correspond to like hardware configuration like 10, 11, or something like this. And the red curve here across all the different points is basically the union of all, all the Pareto curves. Yeah, so this would be the, the optimum you get across all the different hardware configurations. And what you can see in the plot is that there's actually not just a single hardware configuration which makes up this Pareto curves, but there are actually different types of hardware configurations which are important. So for example, when you go to this very efficient but also somewhat low performing area, and there you see this blue hardware configuration, which is, I don't know, hardware config four or so, 
is giving you the best models. And if you go to this like intermediate state, there's like these yellowish, greenish models, which are giving you the best model. And then this high performing reason is more like these green models. And some other models, like these purple models, they tend to work not, not at all, really. So these hardware configurations are probably a bit suboptimal. So that is just to showcase that like the choice of the hardware in this example also has a huge impact on, on the performance that you can get. OK, so after seeing this, um, we kind of ran some hardware co software co-design experiments. And the red curve here in the plot is basically the same as before. So this is 26 hardware configuration. And for each of them, you run NAS. And then in blue, we kind of cherry-picked one hardware configuration from this first experiment. And we ran NAS on that again, but now with like a bigger budget of 26,000 iterations. So that was like the, the budget of the, the previous experiment. And then the last experiment we ran was this really the hardware software code design experiment for kind of the same budget. Uh, so again, 26,000 iterations. And you can see here, we again get like a speed of, of something like 70% and in, in some regions of the Pareto curve. Um, so you can see in this very high performing region there, there's not much difference, but when you go to some other regions, you actually get some really nice speed ups. And the reason for these big differences here is that actually the NAS algorithm here picks hardware configurations which are not part of the 26 that we actually tested. So that means the NAS algorithm discovers some, some hardware configurations which actually the hardware experts didn't really consider. Um, so this is, I think, very nicely showing the, the potential here of just optimizing this uh, without, uh, without human bias, so to say. Okay. Then let me move on with one-shot neural architecture search. So just very small recap here, I guess you all know this. Uh, the idea of one-shot neural architecture search is that instead of considering this architecture search problem as like a discrete optimization problem and you need to like pick a discrete choice between I have tensor A and tensor B in my network, what's the layer that is kind of connecting this, these two tensors? You just build a, a one-shot model or a super model which contains all the different choices that you could make. And so by that, you effectively embed your entire search space into a single model. And then you only have to train like this one model and you have basically trained all architectures from your search space. And after that, or already by, while doing that, um, you can use any, any kind of optimizer to figure out what's now the best neural network architecture in the search space. And so these kind of methods, we are applying to these very classical computer vision problems. Um, so for example, autonomous driving, where you have like some neural network running in a car. And then there are different tasks that this network needs to solve, like segmentation, detecting different kind of objects, or detecting the lanes or so. And so here you have to, like this contrast that you're again, you are limited by the compute that you have in the car and the, the energy you can consume. And on the other hand, you have a, like a pretty hard problem because you have a single neural network which needs to solve all these different kind of tasks. And so the results we got here are that basically, when looking at the performance, again, it's kind of similar performance, but then when you look at the runtime, you get some nice improvements of around 20%. And that at first might seem a bit small compared to the results I showed on, on the other slide, where it was more like 70 or 80%. But the setup here is also very different, so that's also important to note, so to say. So when you're talking about these classical computer vision problems, then your baseline is very, very hard because the baseline here is neural networks that have been like developed by the academic world for years and tens of years. And also in these kind of projects, you really have deep learning engineers that are expert in, in deep learning that are building the baseline architectures that you're trying to beat. So the potential here for improvement is just much, much smaller than in this other application. Because in this other application, there it was mostly about settings where the domain experts were not really deep learning experts. And there's also not a, like, a, a lot of models in the literature that you can actually build up on. But there you kind of start from scratch with, with searching for, for a neural network architecture. And then, of course, the optimization potential there is just much bigger. OK. So the last part of the presentation will be on search-based design. And um, the credits here go to, to Yoshka, who basically did it as his master thesis. Um, so why I want to talk about search-based design is basically that I think it's pretty understudied in, in the academic world. And well, for the academic world, I think this makes a lot of sense to just assume that there are some search-based algorithms, um, because by that you can make sure that new NAS algorithms are actually comparable and all these kind of things. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, but in, in the real world, for, for many applications, we see it's actually unclear how you should build the search space. And 
you're basically running through the same trial and error process that you would also do for figuring out what's the best neural network architecture. And so there's actually like a huge time investment in figuring out what kind of architectures should you look for, like what, what does work well for, for your problem. And you can basically pick one of two options. So the first is that you don't invest a lot of human time and you just pick a very generic search space. But this then very often comes at the cost of a lot of compute you need to invest to then figure out what's a good solution in the search space. Or on the other hand, you can invest a lot of time in de designing the search space and then like running NAS afterwards is like a simpler problem. Um, but of course, this is also somewhat contradicting the idea of AutoML um, that you first need to invest a lot of expertise here. And this gets, I think, even a more interesting problem when you again look at what's the hardware, what's the chip that you eventually want to deploy your neural network on. So this is showing um, the, the latency of different um, types of layers with different kernel sizes on a, on a mobile GPU that was built in, I think, a lot of smartphones a few years ago and tablets. And here what we're doing, we are benchmarking a, a classical mobile net with Freebog versus a very simple convolution plus batch norm layer. And you can see, depending on the kernel sizes, you have like either the one or the, the other is more efficient on, on this hardware. And of course, this picture looks or might look very different if you go to a different chip. So in this case, like an Intel vision processing unit. And you can see here, in all the cases, the, the very simple convolution is actually running much faster than the mobile network. Um, so, and if you have this picture and you know this a priori to, to running NAS, um, this is actually knowledge that you want to build into the search space, right? So if you're running on this Intel VPU, for example, you probably don't want to consider mobile networks in, in this case. Okay, so we asked our question, um, what can you do with the search space design? Can you maybe first look at this, this measure, basically, which is looking at how efficient do some operators, some layers run on your hardware, and if you know that these layers are not running efficiently, can, cannot, cannot we, can, can we just exclude them from the hardware, from the search space in the very beginning. Um, so basically we want to measure for each layer what's kind of their expected contribution to the late, to the accuracy versus what's the cost for running this layer. And the cost for running this layer, this can, we can just benchmark, but then the question is how would you measure what's the contribution to the accuracy of that layer. And so what we do here is just the, the very simplest and uh, stupid thing you can do, and that is we just look at the number of parameters for a layer, and we use that as a proxy for, for measuring the contribution to the accuracy. And this is actually reasonable, I would say, because when you, for example, look at recent papers on, on zero-cost proxies, then it turns out that simply counting the number of parameters is actually a pretty good proxy um, for the performance of your neural network. And it actually outperforms many of the zero-cost proxies in, on, across some, some benchmarks there. So it's a reasonable choice. And then the pruning metric is super simple. So you, for each layer, you just count how many parameters that, does that layer have. And then you measure what's the latency of that layer on the device you're interested in. And depending on this metric, then you can just remove elements from the search space. And the nice thing here is really this is completely training-free here. So assuming measuring the latency is very cheap, there's literally almost no cost involved with this. So you can hopefully, that's, that's the idea, you can save a lot of compute by, by pruning your search space based on a metric which doesn't require training. And so we tested this on, on the block search space, so that's illustrated here. You basically have three different stages, and for each stage there's a block, and this block is optimizable. And it's illustrated here on the bottom how this could look like. So you can generate very simple blocks here, but you can also have like ResNet blocks here or some parallel branches or so. Um, and yet, so that's what we do. So in total, there are something like 90,000 architectures. And uh, we chose this because for like many of these embedded devices, um, this is probably a more reasonable search space than these classical cell based search spaces, which have like really a lot of parallel small operations because these kind of things tend to not run very efficiently on hardware anyway. Even on, on GPUs, you can see that the latency of these types of networks is actually pretty poor. So now we, we are doing the pruning, and what you can see here in the plot is, in the search space, you basically have 45 different choices for the blocks, and that you have for the three stages. So the stages are here, the different spatial resolutions, so 32 by 32, 16 by 16, and 8 by 8. Um, so you have like 40, 45 to the power of three different possible choices. 
And then in the table, you can also see different devices like the mobile GPU that you've seen before, the, the GPU that you've seen before, and some um, yeah, CPUs from, from ARM. And uh, the color here indicates like this metric that I showed before, and now in the, the red boxes, you can see the elements that would remain in the search space after you've pruned it, and like where there are no red boxes, this you would just remove from the search space before you run your NAS algorithms. And you can see that there are quite a few similarities between some, some of the chips or some of the, some of the hardware, but there are also some differences depending on where you go. So this kind of also indicates, again, assuming our metric is meaningful, that you probably want to have different search spaces depending on, on what kind of device you're running the neural networks on in the very end. Okay, so this is now the, the results from the experiment. So here on the x-axis, you can see the iteration of the evolutionary NAS algorithm again, and then on the y-axis, you have the generational distance, which is kind of measuring how far away are you from the Pareto optimal solution, so lower is better. And then in blue, you can see the naive approach of just running Nile on the, uh, our, our evolutionary tool on the entire search space. And then um, you can see different levels of pruning, so either remove like 50, 70, or 90% of the, the search space based on the metric we have. And um, yeah, already for 50%, you get quite a nice improvement, and then 70 and 90% is clearly better than the baseline. And what's also interesting is that for the 90% pruning, there it seems that initially it's doing very well, but in the end it's kind of stagnating. So in these kind of cases, you've probably removed too many of the, the layers, too many of the operations. And um, so, yeah, that was probably too, too much. Yeah. So here in this case, 70% pruning seems to be a nice trade-off. This is now for, for other devices, the same plot. Um, so on the left, exactly the same as on the light, last slide. And then in the middle, we have like an ARM CPU again. The results, they are quite consistent with, with what we saw on the mobile GPU. And then on the right, you can see the VPU. And there actually, the picture is very different. Um, we are not quite sure yet why that's the case. But there you can see that 70 and 90% pruning doesn't really work at all. And 50% pruning is kind of doing the same as the, the baseline. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say why I would say um, might be that they are just, our metric is just based on single layers, right? Um, and it might be that on this VPU, there are some optimizations for, for getting the runtime, which are maybe considering like cross-layer um, optimizations or so, and so this, our metric could not really account for. That's some, some idea we have, but we don't really know right now. Okay, but maybe going back to the cherry-picked results, so this is again the, the mobile GPU. And here on the left, this is just um, like a qualitative um, yeah, illustration of how, how do the results actually look like. So here you can see a scatter plot of all the different architectures that are tried by the NAS method, and again, baseline and 70% pruning. And this is after 500 iterations of the evolution, so not the very beginning, but so much after basically warm starting the method, I would say. And there you can also see that with like 70% pruning of the search space, you tend to discover much more promising architectures than in, in the baseline, where you also have like a lot of really not very well performing architectures. And then on the right, we are, we are trying to answer the question, okay, what's, what would now be the, the speed up that you can get, get from this? And you can see the baseline after 200 and after 2,000 iterations, and then the pruning approach after, seven, after 200 iterations again, and um, you can see that with the pruning approach, after 200 iterations, you kind of get similar performance than the baseline after 2,000 iterations. So in this case, you could save like one-tenth of the compute, so to say. Okay, so that brings me to the last slide. So maybe to summarize, what we're doing at Bosch, um, it's quite diverse, I would say. So it's really from like not at all machine learning to very classical hyperparameter optimization to very classical computer vision one-shot applications, but also like really not, not standard data, so time series data and so on. So um, yeah, quite a, quite a diverse set of problems. So far, I, I don't think there's like a single automatic solution, um, so that's why we're working on these different directions. And then the, the things that I, I think that we realize are really important to us is, um, first, it's this idea of multi-objective optimization that for us, the case in like almost every project, so really important. When it comes to using the tools and adapting them to new use cases, um, it's actually also very important that the tools are simple and that also non-experts can, can use them. Yeah? So this is very often a blocker 
Um, when tools are too complicated, people tend to not use them. And then last point I, I, I've been talking about is um, search-based design is actually really, really important and even also when we like internally benchmark different tools or so, actually it really depends on the search space and how much time you invest in this um, to figure out like what's actually working. And uh, you can get a lot of improvements in, in the NAS method a posteriori when you invest some time in figuring out what's the proper search space. But as of now, I would say there's not really a good solution for doing this and it's still mostly like this trial and error process. Okay, so with that, I'm at the end, and I think we have like a few minutes for questions, probably also. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, ah, yes. Uh, how exactly did you measure the latency for the search spaces? So. Did you do that at some point beforehand? Did you just rerun some of the parts of the search space? So it depends on your device. You can there are different types of approaches. So you can either like really deploy the models on the device and measure it. And that's typically pretty expensive. Um, so for a lot of uh, other vendors, you also have like simulators or so you can use. Um, you also played around with building SOCAP models to measure this latency. But in the experience I showed here, we use some open source tool, which is uh, neural network beta, I think. I think uh, people on Zoom can't ah, do so the, so the question is how do we measure latency? Um, and it depends on, on the, the chip that you're working with. So the worst case solution would be that you actually need to deploy the neural network on the hardware and measure it. And then very often you are also giving simulators by the hardware vendors. Um, you can also think about using surrogate models. And in our case, in the experience I showed in, in the end, we used a neural network meter, which I think is from Microsoft, like an open source tool, which is basically also like a surrogate model. And you can kind of pick a device and then pick a neural network and then like the, the library will give you the latency. Follow up or? Yes. Um, so first, when you look at the library, the, the surrogate is actually worse for the CPU than for the other devices, so that we also thought about. But like the computation of the proxy and the eventual evaluation are both of the same surrogate. So even if it's not correct, like it should be the same way incorrect in both cases. So I don't think that's the issue then. Um, but yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, there was a question in the back, I think. Thank you so much for the presentation, it's very nice. Um, since when does this automatic food exist at Bosch? And how many people are working in it? Uh, it's a bit hard to say, so we're working on these kind of techniques for a couple of years, probably like three or four years or so. Um, we have like these different methods uh, as I showed, and I would say we probably applied them by now in like 10 to 20 projects probably, and um, depends a bit on, on the methods. Um, like the one-shot methods, they are more specialized, and so they are like fewer projects, but with more resources, and then for the other tools, it's often like more diverse projects, but then with like fewer investment and fewer resources. Yeah. Um, do you have some numbers, like we saved this amount of money because we used Ottawa and not like had always a new development team to do like traditional machine mm -hmm. learning again? Yeah, that's... And, and how much are you faster? Because these two numbers, I need kind of to convince management. Yeah. So what was the second thing? Like money and the other thing? Uh, uh, the time of development. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are pretty tricky questions. I'm not sure if I can answer them. Um, so very often we are doing like POCs as we are in the research department and then it's still like a long way to the, like the actual product. So, so in that sense. Um, so I think it's hard to say, like, what are really the numbers. Um, only things we have, I would say, is something like you can speed up the development process and make that simpler, but really making it the numbers, I think it's hard. Yeah, I unfortunately cannot really say anything there. It's, I don't want to say anything which I cannot really prove with data. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's like we are also having this problem, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, Abra. 
Uh, you said that there's no one it's all method, but yeah, I had a discussion with Frank, but is there actually an off the shelf method that could pick for now? So there's you know all these papers in the beginning, of course they didn't have open source code and they were quite expensive, but then there were also efficient methods which were uh, open source, but then they were not robust. So do you have any off the shelf method that you would stay in? You have this problem in the first method that comes to my mind. Probably it's not that. Yes. Yes, that's a good point. So that's also why I said there's no one-fits-all solution. So my, like if you're talking about machine learning and NAS, then my answer would always be when you can afford, I would use evolution. And when you cannot afford evolution, then you probably want to use one-shot. But like what type of one-shot method now, that's a bit unclear. So we are experimenting with like this typical um, two-shot approaches um, where you do some supermodel training and then again use the evolution on top because then you also have like synergies between the, the techniques we are using. And I have the hope that this is at least more robust than, than darts, for example, or in general, like one-stage one approaches. But it's, it's still open to me, yeah? and I, I don't think there's like a really good solution right now. Yeah. Could you check the online question? Yeah, yeah. And Jovita, you can already ask in the meantime. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask, so especially like for semantics mutation or when you have a car which needs to detect something, Ethereal robustness is also quite an important fact there. I haven't looked into that. Um, I mean, you can consider it as an additional objective, right? And in principle, that's kind of the easy answer. But in practice, it's kind of then hard to, to like, actually, how do you measure robustness? There's not, like, a single criteria, right? That's um, true. There are some works which look into definitely, yeah. Yeah, de definitely, yeah. And I mean, for me, as a, like a, from the NAS perspective, I don't care. Like, if there are people that work on robustness, they can give me an objective and I can b build it into the method, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's uh, like a hard problem and there's not a really good answer to that. But it's definitely interesting or definitely very important, yeah. Can I give you the objective and then you can look into it? <laughs> yeah, if you have something, you can give it to me and give that to me. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me check. Um, how long does it take for such experiments, experiences to improve the expert baseline? Um, so it, of course, depends on the, like the base runtime of your, of your training. So as a rule of thumb, I would always say you need like a factor of like 100 compared to simply training the model until you get a, like a decent solution with evolution. And then also very often it's more like a factor of like 500 to 1,000, yeah. Of course, there are many tricks you can use. You can do like multi-fidelity optimization. You can use surrogate models on top. You can use one-shot models on top. So it always depends on your problem. Like it's again the question: How much human time do you want to invest versus how much compute you want to invest? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you answer the question? Oh yeah. 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 Maybe um, as a, as a um, are the experts usually happy that you uh, like, have an AutumnL project or like an AutumnL tool that helps them or like uh, makes their life maybe easier or not? Or is there some like uh, pushback from the experts against this? Yeah, um, it's twofold, I would say. So depends on in which state the project is. So if there is already like a human design solution, then people tend to be a bit skeptical because well, they already invested resources in finding a solution. But in general, I would say they are, most of the time they are pretty open to that. Um, and they are also interested in figuring out like, what can you do with these kind of methods on top. But it's definitely mixed and it's kind of, you need to be careful there with communication. So you shouldn't like not go to customers and say they don't need data scientists or deep learning engineers anymore because like this tool can do this in an automated way. But it's more that you, also, these tools, like almost always, at least for NAS, they don't really work out of the box, and you need NAS expertise to actually run them, which is a bit ironic, of course. But that means, like, it's not like a solution which replaces the, the engineers or so, but it's more to, to assist them in their process and to kind of automate the things that they would do anyway, I would say. Yeah. So, in that sense, I think this is like the right way to, to see it and to communicate it. Okay, great. Then let's thank the speaker.